We've talked about the myth, now let's talk about the man. It's the case of the historical Jesus coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony Sylvia and joining me is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. We have got a really fun topic for today, don't we? We do, yes. And, and we also have a strange definition of fun, but I concur that it is a super fun uh, uh, topic. I will grant you that. And to hel help us have some fun with this topic is returning guest James McGrath from Butler University. Welcome, James. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. Uh, we had a lot of fun last time, uh, and, but uh, this time we're going to, I think, have, a, have even more fun. We're going to talk about the case of the historical Jesus. We're going to talk about whether or not there's a good reason to believe that Jesus actually exists. Now, we've talked about mythicism on this show before, um, the idea that Jesus is uh, a myth and uh, a, an amalgamation of older religious traditions, but uh, there's a lot of people who think that that's probably not the case. And to present the other side of the argument, uh, James is going, to, uh, is going to help us with that. So let's dive right in. Um, historians uh, and, and, and biblical scholars generally don't uh, fall into the mythicist camp. Um, why do you suppose that is? Do you think there's a, a good reason to make a case for a historical Jesus? I personally do. Uh, I think there's a good case that can be made. I think a lot of times people get confused about a number of important terms and categories that really it's important to keep clear uh, if one wants to understand this topic. Uh, unless one understands what kind of figure we're talking about when we're talking about the historical figure of Jesus, unless one has clear what historians do with texts and sources and what kind of evidence they're looking for, then one is going to potentially get an impression of the field that uh, could well be skewed or erroneous or um, just off target in a lot of ways. And so I really think it would be helpful to just back up a little and ask, what do historians mean when they talk about the historical figure of Jesus? Uh, how does historical study work? And I don't know whether most or all readers um, or viewers of your show will tend to be uh, well informed about that topic, but it's an important place to start. Sure. If if you compare That's Jesus right. as a historical figure to uh, Roman emperors or people like that, people who uh, minted coins and fought battles and things like that, then of course there's more evidence for those kinds of people. <laughs> and that doesn't surprise historians. And so when an internet uh, apologist for mythicism gets online and says, well, compare the evidence for Jesus versus this other figure, Nobody's surprised, or nobody should, should be surprised by that. Apples right? and oranges, huh? Right. And so that leads naturally into the second aspect, which is, what do we mean by the historical figure of Jesus? Uh, historians tend to discount miracle claims and those kinds of things right off the bat, uh, because even if they were to investigate them, the things that people call miracles tend to be things that are inherently improbable unless they're just well-timed, you know, natural events, in which case, yeah, the wind was in our favor when we were sailing our <laughs> Navy, you know, okay, yeah, that's um, hit or miss, you know, you had a 50-50 chance, and so, you know, people in interpret those things theologically as well, but those are not inherently improbable, right? Winds blow. But talking about things like walking on water, turning water to wine, most historians won't even bother discussing those things because the most a historian ever does is say something is probable. Mm. And a historian is never going to tell you that something inherently improbable is probable. Mm. And so those kinds of things can kind of be set aside from the outset. And what I think a lot of uh, internet mythicists are lacking is actual detailed acquaintance with the New Testament texts um, and a perspective on them of the sort that historians bring. Mm -hmm. Most mythicists, I think, are familiar with Jesus through Christianity, either that they were brought up in or that people have tried to share with them um, to their dismay on the internet or something of that sort. And so it's the Jesus who is a, a God, who is God incarnate, who's those kind of things. And oftentimes, mythicists that you encounter on the internet are as shocked as conservative Christians are when you start to explain to them and point out to them that Jesus, as we meet him in Mark's gospel, as we meet him in Luke's gospel, is not that sort of figure, mm -hmm. right? He's a human being, 
Uh, people believe that he carried out faith cures and exorcisms. And we know of other people who were believed to have those abilities. And there are people today who are believed to have those abilities. And so the fact that someone who is a teacher, rabbi, messianic claimant might have existed and might have been thought to mediate healing power from God fits Jesus right into uh, the framework of other figures that we have reason to think were historical in that time period. And so it does the exact opposite of uh, situating him in the category of the holy mythical. Mm -hmm. James, I, uh, I just want to clarify, clarify a point, but um, I, I have a lot of secular friends. Um, you know, uh, they know I'm, I, I, I took religious studies at school, and obviously I'm very interested in religion and, and Gnosticism, so sometimes we'll chat about it. And they seem very surprised when I tell them that, you know, most scholars, most secular scholars, historians, believe that there was, or I, I should say, you know, believe in a high probability that there was a historical Jesus. So I just want to clarify one thing. The kind of mainstream academic viewpoint among historians uh, uh, and religious scholars is that there was a historical Jesus. That's not an out there idea in the academy. That would be what most scholars believe. Yes, most scholars, that, that includes uh, most historians, uh, historians of the Greco-Roman world, historians of Judaism, as well as those who work in biblical studies, early Christianity, New Testament. The overwhelming consensus is that there was a historical Jesus. <clears throat> if you want to try and quantify that, put it in perspective in a way that uh, some of your viewers might appreciate, you think about uh, disputes again about evolution in the natural sciences. Now, Historical study and the natural sciences are very different fields, and so the kinds of evidence and the kinds of certainty offered by these two fields is very different, and so I'm not suggesting that. But if you look at the phenomenon of uh, rejection of mainstream consensus in both, you'll find that on the one hand, a lot of similar tactics are used, but on the other hand, groups like you know the Discovery Institute, you know that uh, pedal intelligent design, managed to put together a descent from Darwin list that was fairly large, although it clearly is a very small subset of the actual people working in any way tangentially related fields. And so what some science supporters did was they put together something they called Project Steve in response, uh, named after um, Stephen Jay Gould, who had uh, recently passed away, I think, at that point. And so they just got a list together of people who support the consensus that evolution is not a theory in crisis, and they had far more Steves than they had, uh, you know, the total number of people of all names on the denial list. Oh, There's so they were just Steves. Yeah, so just Steves, and even so they had a larger <laughs> number. Yeah. No, nobody's done that, but somebody should for mythicists. I think the reason the mythicists haven't put together a, a descent from historical Jesus list is that, you know, it, it would have 10 people on it, maybe? You know, I mean, it would have five who have relevant qualifications uh, you know, academic degrees and things like that and are in some way connected with the academy and then would have some others or some people who are academics but are outside of relevant fields. And so it would look a lot like the Descent from Darwin list, but I think it would be much shorter. And then, I don't know, we could put uh, together a, a project, I don't know, we could call it Project Richard, you know, responding to Richard Carrier or something like that, and just get scholars named Richard who think that the consensus is right and would probably be able to do much of the same thing, right? And so one thing I think it's important to emphasize is that this is not a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. What it is is an outdated subject, right? Mm -hmm. This viewpoint that maybe there was no historical Jesus was popular for a long time in certain circles. Uh, it was explored by scholars, it was examined, and was found unpersuasive. And in response to some revival of attention in recent years to this topic, uh, people like Bart Ehrman and Morris Casey took the time to take another look and look at the more recent claims, which largely mirror the older claims, but in some cases there were updates or variations, and still found them unpersuasive, right? And so it's not that this is a taboo topic. In fact, I've long wanted there to be some serious, uh, well-argued, uh, cases for this so that it would give us something to discuss, right? One thing that I think a lot of people don't understand about scholars is that it's part of our job description. It is a requirement for us to have ongoing employment that we publish. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so if there's anything worth discussing, <laughs> we'll discuss it <laughs> eagerly. And so if something is not getting a lot of attention by academics, uh, a conspiracy theory explanation really isn't going to cut it, right? I mean, we want things to talk about. And so if, if we're not discussing a particular thing often, we must really, really think the evidence doesn't support that and that we'll be hurting our own credibility by jumping on that bandwagon. Yeah. James, can you, can you talk to us about some of the major pieces of evidence and, and reasons why historians and scholars are fairly certain that there's a historical Jesus? And kind of specifically, I was wondering if you can talk to us about why the, uh, the, the datum that, that Jesus was crucified makes us believe that there is a historical Jesus. Sure. And if we compare Jesus to you know, other figures in his context, we think of somebody like John the Baptist. Uh, we know about John the Baptist from Christian sources. We know about John the Baptist you know, from Mandean sources, just to make an allusion to the last topic I was mm -hmm. talking about on the show. Uh, Josephus mentions him. But we don't have mentions of him from his immediate followers. We don't have mentions of him in literature closer to his time than we have mentions of Jesus. And one thing that you'll find, particularly among the internet mythicists, is that oftentimes they'll say, well, we only hear about him from Christians. Right? And of course, in our earliest sources, this movement that would eventually be called Christianity doesn't even have that label yet. Mm -hmm. right? Paul never mentions that term. Uh, but if we talk about the phenomenon that would eventually be called Christianity, and just for convenience, we'll say Christianity, um, with the footnote audible, hopefully, to your listeners and <laughs> viewers. But there's no reason why we should expect anyone who wasn't a Christian to be among the first to mention a figure like Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Josephus mentions figures from before and after the time of Jesus who are often viewed by historians as comparable, messianic claimants who predicted that some great sign would happen to confirm that they were who they said they were, and it didn't, and the movement typically dispersed. But we know about them mostly from later sources. If those movements had persisted, we'd probably have heard about them first and foremost from the people who supported it, right? So there's nothing at all surprising there. Uh, and nobody in any other area suggests, well, if you were a disciple of Socrates, then you're disqualified from being testimony as to whether he existed or not. You know, it's just, it, it's actually quite bizarre, right? And if we look at our earliest source, which is Paul the Apostle, right? Uh, he mentions in passing having uh, met with James, the brother of Jesus. And there have been some creative attempts to interpret that phrase in other ways. But the most natural way of understanding it is that he met someone who was the biological brother of Jesus. And Paul mentions some other things which support and confirm the fact that he's talking about a figure he at the very least believes to be a historical figure. Mm -hmm. That includes the claim that uh, he was of the seed of David according to the flesh. And Richard Carrier goes to great lengths to try and situate even those things in the celestial realm. But that's pretty unlikely. Let's put it that way. Um, Sperm is more often found on Earth than in the heavens. Let's put it that way. It seems, like, seems pretty straightforward, that phrase, right? yes. Yeah. And there are instances where we have mentions of things like the heavenly Jerusalem or things like that. But precisely because there's a more mundane earthly Jerusalem, you don't always get specifically earthly Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem all the time. But when somebody mentions something celestial, they'll add celestial or heavenly or something like that to it because you're talking about something that's not mundane. When you hear and hoofbeats, so, yeah. think horses, not zebras, right? Yeah, that's, you know, and not the four horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> like that. Not yet, anyway. Uh, although the fact that I thought about that, that's probably a professional pitfall rather than something that, you know, you can make a general point about. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so Paul mentions this descent from David, and a historian would point out to you, you know, I'll point out to you, having done some family history research, uh, anyone who's done family history research will probably have heard some stories about you know, royalty or nobility in their family tree. Mm. And most I'm of us... I'm descended from Charlemagne. Sorry. <laughs> Congra congratulations. 
Uh, Thank you. And and there are some internet there are some internet genealogies that would allow you to trace it from him back to Jesus in case you are interested in doing that. <laughs> oh, but that's good. probably a topic for another show. Uh, yeah. But most of us, if we've done some digging, uh, have found at least some claim to nobility or something like that mm -hmm. has turned out to be false or to have no evidence to support it. Right? <laughs> More people claim to have been of noble birth or descent or ancestry than actually had it. Yeah. And so whether the family of Jesus was actually descended from David is a different kind of question. But when Paul's talking about Jesus as an anointed one, as a Messiah, right? he's not talking about something generic. Uh, he's not talking about a priestly d descendant of Aaron. He's talking about a specific concept, which is the Davidic anointed one. And that's referring to a kingly figure, right? The expectation that the kingship would be restored to the dynasty of David, the line of David would be res restored to the throne. And that expectation had some clear elements to it, one of which was restoring the line of David to the throne. And so being executed by the foreign overlords that most people hoped this figure would defeat was almost automatic disqualification. Right as far as your claim to have been the Messiah, the Davidic Messiah, mm -hmm. the Davidic anointed one. And so if you're inventing a religion from scratch or based on earlier mythology or anything like that, and as early Christians clearly were, you're trying to convince Jews that this figure is the Davidic uh, anointed one, then you don't invent that he was crucified. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I heard, um... Oh, gosh, I think it might have been John Oliver or somebody recently saying that if you were if you were making up a story um, and you want people to believe it, you don't include all the embarrassing things that don't uh, you know that don't further your point. And uh, yeah, and uh, and the crucifixion here in this case uh, really doesn't help the early Christians' case at all. It doesn't. It doesn't. Given the kind of figure they were claiming, right? There are other. You know, if you're claiming that he's a dying and rising God or something like that, who knows, maybe it would work. Yeah. But the evidence is quite clear that that's not who the earliest Christians, according to the sources that we have, were claiming that Jesus was. And it's interesting. Oftentimes, mythicists are you know, rather credulously accepting Christian claims that historians actually find problematic. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I've encountered mythicists who will say that Jesus is patterned entirely on these uh, prophecies, these texts in the Jewish scriptures that he said in the New Testament to fulfill. And I really get the sense that they've only heard that he fulfills them from either from Christian apologists or made from the New Testament authors. And they haven't actually looked carefully at these texts and noticed, okay, so let's see, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one are not actually predictions about a Messiah at all. And so claiming that Jesus fulfills it doesn't get you anywhere. This one that they're claiming he fulfills, he kind of doesn't look like he does. And so they're really trying hard to force Jesus into that mold, right? So if you're inventing a figure based on the prophecies, you invent one that fulfills the prophecies. Yeah. That's, it's common sense, right? That's what you would do. When we see Christians trying hard to explain why Jesus doesn't fit the texts or picking really weird te texts and drawing strange c connections to Jesus, we get the sense that we're, they're dealing with an actual figure about whom they couldn't just make up absolutely anything they wanted to. Because not only were there things that Christians knew, but also there were things which opponents would draw to their attention if they tried to simply ignore them, right? Christianity doesn't emerge in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so when you're dealing with a historical figure, one of the things that is an issue that you have to deal with is that even if you'd like to forget some things about that figure that are uncomfortable or <laughs> don't fit your, the claims you want to make, opponents and people who disagree with you will often remind you. And so you have to make the effort to explain those things away, offer some kind of explanation, however ad hoc. And we see those kinds of things in our early Christian sources. Mm -hmm. Well, let's wrap things up there and then continue this conversation into the podcast. Uh, I think we've got... Uh, we've only tackled two of our 35 questions, so we've got, quite, <laughs> we got quite a lot to talk about. So stay tuned for that, everybody. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, do you want to tell us where people can find you on the Internet? Tell, tell everybody about your blog, because I've been really enjoying that lately. Oh, well, glad to hear it. My blog is called Exploring Our Matrix. 
as you could probably guess from the title, I'm a science fiction fan, and so that's one of the things I blog about. But I do also blog about the New Testament, the historical figure of Jesus, and I've spent probably a good decade or more talking about mythicist claims, uh, some of the better ones that you actually find in print in places, but also some of the weaker internet ones, uh, some of the memes and YouTube videos and things like that. We'll talk all and about so, those in the podcast. <laughs> okay, so Exploring Our Matrix is the place to find those. Just type that in and you'll find your way there. All right, fantastic. So thanks for joining us once again, and we will continue this conversation over in the podcast. So uh, I wanted to remind everybody that if you would like to hear more on this topic, you can do so by subscribing to our podcast. Just visit our website at GnosticWisdom.net, and you'll see a link to Talk Gnosis After Dark right there on the, on the webpage. And you can subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or RSS, or you know any of your uh, fancy podcast-catching devices. Um, and uh, I heard recently from some feedback from some people saying, oh, these, these shows are too short. You should talk more about the topics. I'm like, well, yeah, we do. We have this whole hour-long podcast. But uh, maybe people don't listen all the way to the end. You should. Anyway, uh, so that, that'll be it, and that'll do it for us for the video portion. We'll continue this over in the podcast. And for everybody watching along at home, we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.